For this week, um, we are looking at the Crusades. We are looking at uh, the period from the late 11th century uh, down until at least the late uh, 13th century, if not beyond, when uh, in various ways and for various reasons, people from Western and Central Europe decided to go on Gezi to the Near East. They thought, oh, it's nicer and warmer, let's go to the Mediterranean and see what we can do. And obviously they had a, a slightly more serious motivation than what I, I just suggested. Um, Anyone can tell us the etymology of the English word, but it's not a native English word, it's been borrowed. Where does the word crusade come cross? Okay, which you can see there. Um, in Latin, crux, okay, via French in this case, because of the Christian cross, which traditionally, at least, I'm sure not every single crusader in the 11th, 10th century, whatever, was wearing a cross uh, on, their, uh, on their clothing, but the idea that obviously it's some kind of Christian holy war, and so the cross, which is the symbol of Christianity, was very important for that. Um, Murat T and Jeren are going to be our presenters on Friday. We'll again have two presentations on the Friday this week. It would have been good if Murat were here, but he's not, uh, to have done the first one today, and then we could have spread things out a little bit. So I'm going to talk now in the next kind of half an hour or so uh, rather more generally about the things, and some of the things I'll say will probably overlap a little bit with what the two presenters will say, and they're going to look at uh, certain crusades in, in more detail. But it's probably good to, to think more broadly about them because there is this concept, the crusades, okay, which is seen as some kind of... Uh, a unified idea, and so we need to uh, we need to discuss that in in uh, one way or another in order to put their details into a, a broader context. My main argument today will be that beyond saying the Crusades, beyond the kind of broader uh, definition, uh, it's very hard to actually say what the Crusades were. It's very hard to actually kind of pin the concept down uh, and say this is the Crusades and it applies here in uh, 1096 for example, it also applies here uh, 100 years later or here 200 years later or, or, or whenever. Okay? Um, there were a number of expeditions, Gezileir, whatever we want to call them, to uh, the Near East from various parts of Europe uh, during the uh, Central and later Middle Ages. Uh, whether we can then collect them all together and give them a sort of unified character is the thing which I want us to uh, maybe think a little bit about today. We don't even agree on when the Crusades, we more or less agree, most people agree on when the Crusades begin. So again, we'll say 1096, okay. Uh, Pope Urban uh, II uh, makes his proclamation uh, in Clermont and we uh, will be looking, I hope we have some time with the two presentations, but we'll be looking at the different versions of his proclamation, of his call for a crusade uh, on Friday and I've put those things uh, on Moodle, so please uh, have a look at those. Sorry? Two, yes, yeah. Um, so most people will agree there. We don't necessarily talk about a crusade earlier than uh, the late, right at the end of the 11th century. But when we say the crusades have finished, so even chronologically it's hard to draw a line. Uh, I myself, for kind of for convenience, uh, often say 1291 when the crusader, uh, by that time very small, uh, uh, sort of uh, territory um, based on Acre uh, was, uh, was recaptured by uh, the Muslims and so therefore kind of a significant or notable uh, European presence uh, in that part of the world uh, ceased to exist. There were subsequently uh, other expeditions into 
uh, well, not necessarily the Middle East or the Near East, but uh, 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 Muslim territories, and there were subsequent wars between uh, people of uh, Christian and Muslim persuasion, uh, and some people would then consider these to be, in one way or another, crusades as well. And I think Murat or Jaron may be talking a little bit about this. I can't remember now. Uh, we may. Murat will have some th thoughts about this as well. We'll see. It's a shame he's not here to, uh, to contribute to that. Um, so this is kind of like perhaps the most sort of basic one, which is a 200-year period, more or less, when we have the First Crusade. Then we have the creation of uh, a series of uh, Crusader states. Uh, and this is kind of the Crusader states uh, in the 12th century at their greatest, at their greatest uh, extent. Uh, and then that is gradually by stages reduced until, as I said, 1291, where we can kind of say uh, things might be uh, pretty much at an end in any uh, effective way. The Crusades, of course, are uh, quite a popular subject because there's a sense of kind of romance uh, about it, medieval knights going on trips and fighting for whatever and so on. Uh, and then, of course, there's a rather negative side of it, which is... Uh, Interreligious warfare, which is something which uh, from the end of the 20th century until today uh, has a slightly different meaning, but is also a, obviously a source of negative uh, negativity in the world today. And of course, um, it was uh, George W. Bush who misused the word crusade, or rather uh, wasn't very careful uh, in using the word crusade uh, uh, with a small c when he wanted to obviously uh, uh, punish uh, Al-Qaeda or whatever uh, for what they'd done um, and said we will have a crusade against these people. The English word crusade without the big letter C is used in what sense? Can someone give us a, uh, a definition of crusade uh, in the more general sense rather than the crusades in this sense? If you say I'm going to have a crusade against... Mm. I would limit it. I mean, um, you have a mission. You have something which you're, you want to change. Okay? And so sometimes, in English at least, we can say, uh, I'm going to have a crusade against that. Okay? Um, so it might be, I don't know, uh, on the rector's uh, a Moodle uh, forum for the academics, there's been some discussion recently about the problem that students smoke beyond those signs that say no smoking here, and they smoke beyond those signs, and how that should be enforced. So you could say, I will have a crusade against the fact that students don't do that. So this is something I want to solve, and I'm going to do it in a rather serious and to some extent rather belligerent kind of a way. Okay, I'm going to really go for that. So that, that's the meaning there, that we're going to go against that problem. Okay? And that's in a way the way that he was using it, but obviously he implied a rather uh, more violent uh, uh, response than just we wouldn't go around hitting people if they're smoking in the wrong place or something like that. So it has this range of meanings to something a little bit more like what we were saying. Okay? So, uh, uh, a crusader in that sense is someone who has a mission and wants to solve a certain series of problems or something like that. Um, so in terms of the word and, and so on, we have, a, uh, we have a specific kind of uh, period that we're dealing with, um, but the implications are, are rather loose. Um, <coughs> From the historian's perspective, and once again I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about primary sources because that's what uh, uh, professional historians get excited about uh, in archival uh, rooms and so on. Uh, the Crusades are very interesting because uh, they deal with, well, they deal with Europeans primarily in a non-European part of the world. And so we end up using a vast array of different sources written in very, very different languages. You can't be a crusade historian effectively, I should say, uh, and know Latin, and that's it. Okay? You might want to know uh, Arabic, obviously. You might want to uh, learn some uh, Syriac, uh, for example, because in that period, uh, Syriac was used uh, 
uh, by a number of Christian communities in that part of the world. Uh, and even Armenian might be something you might need to, uh, to be familiar with uh, as well. So uh, to look at all the different sources, uh, and Greek I should add, uh, to look at all the different sources and get a round picture, a full picture, uh, you need to be a, uh, a fairly uh, a linguistic superhero in that sense. And that's what we have. A, we have one or two people who've, who've done these things at Bill Kent. We have one student who did his PhD in the States. And he was not only good at Latin, but he also went there and learned Syriac and other things and worked on kind of roughly this kind of stuff or whatever. Um, so uh, it's difficult, but also quite interesting. Um, the sources themselves are varied. Now, obviously, um, for example, we have things written usually in Latin, by the Europeans, who are going on the crusade, who are involved in one way or another uh, on the trip from Europe to uh, Jerusalem or wherever it might be. Uh, and then they are writing down later or at that time uh, their accounts of things. Uh, for example, uh, for the first crusade, there was an individual called Fulcher of Chartres, uh, who wrote an account of the First Crusade, essentially, uh, and used some other sources as well. But he was involved in the uh, Crusade itself. He was a, uh, a crusader in that sense, and he wrote an account of that. Uh, also, a man called Stephen, who was Count of Blois in France, and he was married to Adele, the daughter of William the Conqueror, the, guy who, the Norman guy who came over to England in 1066, Okay, and he went on crusade and he wrote a series of accounts of letters kind of back to his wife uh, saying, oh, darling, I miss you, and so on, but also saying uh, more important things of what was going on or whatever. Uh, and so we have a number of what we would call first-hand accounts from the crusaders' perspective uh, of what happened uh, for the first crusade and for uh, later crusades as well. One of the things which the first crusade achieved, as we said, was this series of um, a thin spread of principalities and kingdoms uh, set up by the uh, Crusaders uh, and maintained with varying degrees of success uh, for a few hundred years. And so you actually had people of European origin, European culture and outlook, but who were born in the Near East. Okay? So they're not Crusaders in the sense that they didn't go on the Crusade. They are in a sense, native people born there, uh, who will write often in Latin, but will have some familiarity with perhaps Arabic uh, and will actually have access to uh, 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 things like that. So an example of that is the scholar William of Tyre, uh, who used a variety of sources in his accounts uh, of his world in that sense. And these people often had a very, very different perspective to what was going on in the Crusader states in the Near East to what was the perspective of someone who's just arrived from France and says, OK, where are the Muslims, where are the Turks, or something like that. So um, uh, it's interesting to have their, their point of view given as well. Non-European or non-Latin sources uh, will obviously not always be focusing on the Crusades, as we call them as such. Arab historians, uh, Syriac uh, chroniclers, um, uh, Armenian chroniclers or whatever, Greek historians, they will be writing about whatever topic they want to write about, the history of the Muslim world or uh, the reign of a particular Byzantine emperor. And as part of that, they will have to mention the Franks, as they're often called, the Crusaders, who impinge upon their history, sometimes more, uh, sometimes less. So we don't have kind of Arabic things that this is the history of those Franks or something, or those Crusaders, but they feature in uh, accounts uh, of, uh, of Near Eastern history uh, or uh, Anatolian history, whatever, by, uh, by these people. So whereas the Latin ones are often writing about this is the history of the Crusade or this is the account of this kingdom or whatever, uh, the other guys are writing uh, more broadly about uh, their own history, but they mention the Crusaders. And then you have to balance out the different biases, the different perspectives uh, to work out what really happened. The Latin guys say this, the Arabs say this, obviously 
uh, they have a very different perspective because in many cases uh, the, the people they're talking about were at war and they support different sides or something and they come up with uh, uh, different accounts and then you have to kind of coordinate them and try and work out what really happened okay? because all historical sources in one way or another are uh, obviously biased uh, for various reasons. What we'll be looking at next week is not looking at different <coughs> uh, linguistic accounts. All the sources we are looking at well, on, sorry, on Friday will be written by uh, uh, Christian uh, Europeans of one sort or another, uh, giving the account of, of Urban's uh, uh, original proclamation. But even there, uh, the problem of working out what exactly he said or what, was, what he thought he was saying are, uh, are very important. Okay, now... Um, To say what something was, we also want to think about what caused it. It gives us an idea of what's its origin, and that might give us some picture of, of really what the cause was. Uh, the short-term cause of the Crusades was, as we said, uh, right at the end of the 11th century, the Pope uh, finally decided to send help, or in some ways help, the, uh, uh, the Byzantines and answer their request for help against uh, uh, Muslim or, or Turkish armies and so on. Uh, so the short-term cause is Pope Urban and his decision to, uh, to call people together. But historians can see that feeding into uh, 1096, uh, before and after, are a variety of uh, other factors, long-term factors, contextual factors, which, which contributed in one way or another to uh, what went on. Um, and again, uh, what different people thought they were doing when they went on crusade, uh, means that even the Crusades themselves were, uh, were a bit different. So one obvious very large thing for us to be aware of is that the Crusades are in one way or another religious. There is an ecclesiastical, a church element uh, feeding into here. And there are different parts to this, different aspects uh, to this, of course. For many, many people participating in the Crusades at one time or another, uh, they thought themselves as pilgrims. They were going to the Holy Land. This was the land uh, where Jesus Christ was born uh, and where his life and his miracles were uh, enacted. And so, of course, it's a very important place uh, for them in that sense. So to be able to go there and to be able to go there uh, and hopefully uh, experience things was very important. So uh, there was a tradition going back even earlier of Christians who would go into the uh, Holy Land uh, on some kind of pilgrimage. It would be a little bit different because it was now ruled by, uh, uh, primarily controlled by Muslims, but still there was this tradition going back even earlier of, of, of pilgrimage, and this feeds into to this kind of a thing. In addition, there was, for a while before the Crusades themselves, uh, growing uh, concerns in the church, in society, about uh, somehow limiting and controlling secular violence. Okay? And the Crusades uh, were a, uh, obviously a rather violent uh, uh, phenomenon. So uh, there are various traditions feeding in uh, from this side as well. There was something called the Truce of God, a kind of peace movement uh, from a hundred years or more before, where members of the church were saying we need to somehow uh, control uh, the violence in society uh, and stop this from going on. So uh, that's the first step to limit it and then the next step is to kind of say well or we'll control it for our own purposes so the violence as long as it's the right kind of violence against the right kind of people isn't bad it's fighting ourselves which is a bad thing but fighting against the enemies of God well actually that's not so bad okay and even Saint Augustine has arguments in, uh, in uh, to support the idea of holy war and that was a, uh, a few hundred years earlier so 10th 11th century we see these kind of shifts from limiting violence to uh, church controlled violence and then the idea of of kind of holy war as part of that so one uh, religious interpretation of the crusade is to see it in that context not so much as a pilgrimage but as uh, a holy war in that kind of a sense K 
connected to that as well is the growing concept during this period a bit later of chivalry. What chivalry? What was chivalry? Something we're going to talk about next week, I think. But let's have a little brief anticipation of that. Chivalry, knights, yes. Sorry? Yeah, it's those put together. So it's basically fighting with honor, okay, in a sense. Knights who are technically uh, warriors <coughs> sitting on a horse. If you don't have a horse, you're not a knight. Uh, with a certain, increasingly a certain social status as well. Nobility mixing into that. But in addition, this idea that there is a certain code of honour and code of behaviour which defines your ideas as well. And all these stories that were going around, popular stories, King Arthur and so on, are all part of the, uh, the image of that. And um, uh, many people kind of idealised the concept of the knight and the church got involved. Some, some of the morals, some of the codes of behaviour that knights were expected to do were very much Christian morals, controlled or, or dictated or uh, encouraged by the church. So uh, the mixture of the church and the violence, which to some extent we might say uh, uh, we shouldn't be seeing, of course, uh, uh, and it's not something which we can see necessarily in the New Testament, uh, we can start feeding into this growing concept of, of chivalry as well. And during the Crusade period, we see the creation of what we call military orders. Anyone know some of the more famous military orders? So they are kind of monastic orders who fight. Yes, the Templars, the Hospitallers, yes, and, and others, and a few lesser ones, created to a large extent during the Crusade period, uh, so that you can be religious and follow a, be a member of an order like you are Cistercians or the Cluniacs we were mentioning last week, but your job is to fight, okay? And they have, depending on your perspective, a good or a bad effect upon the Crusades and uh, the Crusade estates and so on. We might talk a bit about that uh, on Friday again. So that fits into all this thing as well, that the Christianity and violence kind of uh, are overlapping. As we were looking at last week, of course, It was in the previous few decades that the papacy was uh, pioneering and championing uh, cr uh, reform of Christian society and particularly uh, uh, of the church against the secular world. And it's not surprising, therefore, that right at the end of that period we do have one of the uh, members of uh, the reform uh, group uh, proclaiming the crusade. And was this just a political move on the part of Herbert? Was he trying to say, okay, let's do something and I'm in charge and therefore that gives me the power? Because he definitely envisaged this as something with the papacy in charge and the papacy would make gains. And so is he using it purely for religious reasons, whether they're good ones or bad ones, or is it more a political thing that he's trying to uh, use this idea as a way of giving himself or the papacy a little bit more independence, a little bit more power, and things like that. And we can discuss those points uh, 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 later in the week, perhaps. You could also see the crusade as, um, let's put secular here, I suppose, and that's where the chivalry thing comes in. Uh, you could say it as the next phase of the expansion of the Germanic here in a more loose sense, Germanic peoples. Okay? We started the course looking at uh, the Franks and the Goths and the Vandals moving out of Central uh, Europe into the Roman Empire uh, and becoming uh, uh, the uh, rulers of the new kingdoms and so on, phase one. We've talked about the Vikings, the stay-at-home Germanic people a few centuries later suddenly having this massive impact on the world. Uh, and now you can't go any further west, so then you move east. So maybe the, not necessarily the, the Germanic is in this looser sense, but uh, people from these areas and their descendants searching for new land. 
Why were the Germanic peoples expanding? Why were the Vikings going out? And maybe we can see some more secular reasons for this. And this time, uh, the fighters are moving east and they're marching in big groups rather than sailing in long ships and, and whatever. But it's part of the same phenomenon and the same causes of looking for land and things like that. And obviously, uh, you go on pilgrimage, you go home. But obviously a lot of people didn't go home, they stayed around to create and manage these kingdoms, okay? Just as Vikings created Norway, uh, Normandy, for example, or Vikings went to Iceland, maybe it's something a little bit similar as well. So there are, uh, the secular uh, side of this uh, is important. And finally, uh, what's going on in the East, okay? We often excessively look at the Crusades from the point of view of the Westerners, but um, sorry, uh, but obviously um, people living in the uh, in this part of the world were very very actively involved in the development of the Crusades, um, the conquests by the Seljuk Turks, which then led to uh, the Byzantines asking for help to the east to the west. Uh, obviously, very very important causes uh, for what leads to the Crusades in that sense. What the Byzantines thought was going to happen and was should happen and what the Western guys thought happened uh, were often very, very different. Okay? And again, I won't anticipate perhaps what Murat's going to say on Friday too much, but we do see uh, uh, we have to give uh, the fuller perspective by looking at uh, the various uh, peoples involved. Uh, we've mentioned what have I got here. We've mentioned, of course, the, uh, the Byzantines. Um, the, the Seljuk Turks uh, creating, in the process of creating a sort of Turkish Anatolia at this point, very important as we've said. And then, of course, uh, sometimes we talk about Muslim, sometimes we talk about Arabs, sometimes we talk about Turks. Uh, what the people in Europe understood by these things was often very, very different. Okay? We'll see in some versions of, um, of the uh, uh, Urban's proclamation, he talks about the Turks, who are a race of Persians. So you'll all be very happy to know that you're just Iranians, really. According. They obviously had no idea about linguistic differences or whatever. They just saw people uh, uh, as kind of the Easterners. Um, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the different words or concepts for, for Muslims and so on when we looked at uh, uh, Islamic Spain and, and things like that. Uh, you often get in European accounts, the concept of the Saracen, which just means Easterner. Okay, Shark or something means uh, East in, in Arabic. So it just literally means Easterner, which obviously can mean all sorts of different things. And one of our students a few years ago looked at the different terms for ethnic groups in the, uh, in the early crusading sources and so on to get up with some idea of what people understood and thought they understood and things like that. Um, the biggest danger with the Crusades is to see it purely in terms of ethnic or religious divisions. And on the one hand, that's obviously the basis of it. A bunch of European Christians come to uh, the Near East and try and take it away from uh, the Muslims. Somewhere in the middle are the kind of Eastern Christians, the Byzantines, who are obviously a bit of both or whatever. But uh, even the religious split is wrong. Uh, these um, crusader states, these European states that were set up uh, in, right at the end of the 11th century, and Carindon, uh, in some cases, quite uh, for a long time afterwards, they were not always fighting the uh, uh, Muslim powers who were, to a large extent, to their south and mostly to their uh, east. They were often cooperating with one Muslim leader against another one. Okay? So we don't always have the idea that somehow it's the Christians and the Muslims or the Europeans and the Arabs and the Turks or whatever. Okay, once this situation is created, you get a different status quo and you get different groups doing things for their own rather more political and individual purposes. It's good for us to ally with those Christians against this guy because otherwise he's going to come over and, and take over our lands or whatever and, and things like that. So I'm hoping we'll see a little bit of that going on as well. And as I said before, the uh, European Christians from uh, France and Germany and elsewhere were not always on good terms, had a good relationship with the Byzantines as well. So uh, things don't always have to be broken down simply into religious terms, though that's obviously a very, very important part of the overall picture of things. Um, 
And finally, final sort of general point that we should bear in mind uh, in this attempt to say that we can't really define the Crusades very clearly is that uh, each Crusade uh, had its own character. It's had its own reason for existing and coming into being and it ended up whatever people thought they were doing when they set off from France and Germany or whatever and started marching uh, it ended up doing often very very different things so we have crusades that are aimed at capturing Muslim lands and succeeding doing that we also have crusades that end up fighting Christians we have crusades that end up with Christians fighting each other and, and things like this. So uh, each crusade has got its own uh, characteristic uh, and uh, motivation and so on. So again, we can't say uh, crusades were just this and that's the final thing. We do have a, a variety and I think again Jiren and, and Murat are going to illustrate that with looking at some of the earlier crusades on Friday. So I won't go into the, the details of that. So I've been talking a lot today. I like to talk, um, but then that's what the whole purpose of this is. They can't hear your voices very well at all, so uh, uh, Emma is happy today, I guess. But um, my main thesis, my main argument here is that um, it's very difficult to talk about the Crusades and know definitely what we're meaning, okay? And I hope you've got that point. Um, we're going to have more specific details on Friday, um, but what we mean by Crusade at a specific point or in general uh, varies okay and to use a phrase we've I've used before with reference to the Vikings where we said it's hard to pinpoint the Vikings they were doing different Vikings I said were doing different things uh, in different ways at different places at different times so in a sense different crusaders were doing were crusading or whatever for different reasons at different points uh, and going to different places they didn't all go to Jerusalem to try and recapture Jerusalem we get people uh, attacking uh, Egypt and North Africa and, and so on so uh, uh, the general idea of even of religious warfare as I said is a bit limited because we do have cooperation between Muslims and Christians and we have Christians fighting each other so even that uh, aspect uh, isn't cannot be applied hundred percent you got that? Yes? Any questions then? Any comments? Um, the f oh yeah, the funny thing when we talked about the Crusades a few years ago in uh, an earlier uh, this course previously is that uh, kind of from the European perspective, you know, the Crusades were a bit of a failure really and come to very much. They didn't actually end up re-establishing uh, Christian or, or European hegemony in the Middle East uh, and you know, the, that, that part of the world is is still largely uh, 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 Muslim in, uh, in, um, in religious persuasion and so on. So the Crusades in that sense failed. They were not something which achieved something. But my students said, oh, for us, we see the Crusades as a very bad thing and they, they had a very bad effect on, on our part of the world and on Muslim civilization. And I'm thinking, well, a bunch of Europeans came, they hung around for a while, they killed quite a few Byzantines at certain points, and then it all failed anyway. So um, obviously that's rather flippant and, and uh, uh, simplification of it all. But again, the different perspective uh, it does give you a different view of, of things in that sense as well. Okay, any questions? Anyone want to add anything? Anyone want to add a comment here? Anything follow through? Everyone's feeling silent late afternoon. Alp is yawning, I can see. Uh, <laughs> you can cut that bit. Um, uh, okay, let's finish there then. So we'll, we've got a lot to do on Friday, so we need to start pretty quickly. I won't stand around talking. We'll have Murat, we'll have Jeren, and we're going to look at Pope Urban uh, II. And there's a few other little things that we might, points we might fill in. I don't know, for example, if Murat's going to talk much about the Crusader states and so on. That's quite an interesting uh, thing as well. But uh, we'll see what time we have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, see some of you tomorrow, the others on, on Thursday. The rest of you I shall see on Friday. I have noticed, hang on, wait a minute. I have noticed some people have signed up for an appointment and didn't give me an essay. And some people gave me an essay and didn't sign up for an appointment. So I'm not really sure what's going on there, but we'll find out about that as we go along.